Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Trento with Rabindra Anija, and we're here to talk about some of the issues that are going on when you start integrating IP and SOCs these days. There's one of the problems that you run into is that if you verify this at a local level because you have to divide and conquer some of the uh, complexity in an SOC, it doesn't necessarily translate the same way in at the SOC level when you finally put all the stuff back together. So Rabindra, what, how do we reconcile these two worlds? We have the SOC side and we have the very local side where people are doing some of the verification. What are the problems that you're seeing and, and how do we go about solving this? Okay. So what we see uh, when we talk to our customers, uh, they have to verify their IPs exhaustively uh, at IP level, and then they have to do some specific uh, types of verification at SOC level uh, because they have to break their verification problem into two pieces. And the uh, uh, reason being is that IPs are, or SOCs are so big these days that you cannot verify each and every function at SOC level. So you have to break it into smaller pieces, test it at IP level, and somehow convey that information at SOC level to make sure you're using IPs inside SOCs the way IP was uh, developed as well as verified. So today what we're going to talk about is how you can convey that information from one level to other to make sure in your integration uh, issues can be found in a systematic and predictable way. Okay, so why don't you draw this out for us and show us what, what's going on here. So uh, on the whiteboard here, I have, uh, uh, if we concentrate on the upper portion of uh, this whiteboard here, I have divided the whiteboard into two, ca uh, two parts. Left-hand side is the IP level, so you can kind of look at it in the time going from left to right. Left-hand side is IP level and right-hand side is SOC or subsystem level. So at IP level, what you're trying to do is you're trying to exhaustively verify your IP or block uh, uh, to make sure each and every function is exhaustively verified. You can use variety of techniques uh, to uh, verify your design. These days, we, when we talk to our customers, they have a very uh, sophisticated uh, UVM or VVM-based uh, verification environment. So they are throwing as much as traffic they can on their IPs to make sure it is exhaustively uh, verified. So here what I'm describing here, you have your RTL and you have your simulation stimulus. So we have a certain synthesis technology which can combine RTL information as well as uh, simulation stimulus information to generate properties which capture the behavior, what your RTL is supposed to do and how it has been tested. So if I have to summarize it in one sentence, sentence it is capturing RTL intent as well as your test bench intent. And once you have these properties, I have some, some of the examples here. Uh, I'll come back to those examples in a minute. But diagram here at the bottom, you can, can consider this as my, my IP. And these dots within the IP uh, are representing different functions that my, uh, my design has and how it has been tested. So you can consider this as a state space of your IP. And I'll come back to when I get into the SOC domain. But for now, uh, uh, from a conceptual per, uh, perspective, you can understand it as representation of my, my IP in terms of properties. That looks like a very amorphous structure. Is that the way IP really comes across in a design? In terms of properties, yes. Okay, so now you have these properties here which are standard system where log assertions. Uh, and uh, we write properties in a very, very simple way so that it is easy for easy to understand even for a person who is not familiar with SVA. They are very close to Verilog expressions that you would see in uh, Verilog. So, so anybody can understand these properties very easily. So I have th three examples here to illustrate what kind of issues you can catch very, very easily uh, with this methodology. So my first property here, again, now I'm, I'm crossing over from IP to SOC level and I'm describing these three properties here. First property here says my mode, mode is not equal to, to H3, what, hex three. What it means is that when I was testing my IP at IP level, this, is, this was the behavior of my IP. It means, for example, this 128-bit uh, uh, mode was not supported for this IP, okay? Second property what it describes is, I have a function where I can have read and write, but they cannot be true together. You cannot have read and write function together. Third one is, what you're describing here is that you have an interrupt and you assert an interrupt, but in, very, in a very next cycle, you take it back. So these three properties are describing different functions, uh, how your IP is supposed to behave and how it has been tested at IP level. Now, once you have these properties which are representing your IP, you take it to your SOC verification environment. 
and this environment can be simulation based or emulation based. So, so these properties support both the platforms, um, whatever you have. Once you start simulating these properties in your SOC environments, invariably you will see that these properties will fail, right? And if these properties fail, uh, we can kind of look at each and every other, each, and, uh, each example here one by one. If first property fails here, it will point to something like IP configuration issue, uh, which is at SOC level, you are uh, using 128-bit uh, mode, but your IP either doesn't support it or it was not, it was not tested at uh, uh, IP level. Or you were not supposed to configure your IP that way at SOC level, but accidentally you configured your IP in such a way. So it's good to know that you're not verifying your IP correctly. So either way, you catch these IP configuration issues in a very, very predictable way. If I look at a second property, which was describing that our, uh, your read and write cannot be true together, if that fires, it means you have a bug in your design, right? You did not catch it at IP level. I mean, basic premise is that your IP level environment has to be exhaustive, but sometimes it's not because at SOC level, different IPs are interacting with each other. So you can uh, get some traffic on your IP, which you did not throw on your IP at uh, IP level. So if that property fires, you found a bug. Third situation here is where, as I described it earlier, you had an interrupt which was getting uh, deasserted in the next cycle. If that property fires, actually it points to a IP coverage hole because the designer looks at it and say, wait a minute, whenever I assert an interrupt, actually it should be asserted for a few cycles because I want to see how my system is going to react to that interrupt. So effectively at IP level what happened, the guy who was writing the test he asserted this interrupt and deasserted right away, which means test was very, very optimistic, right? Guy was trying to do a check in the box, I need to send the interrupt, but he didn't let it go for a while and deasserted uh, de right away. So now, SOC guy can go back to IP guy and say, hey, my design as well as verification environments supports that behavior where interrupt has to be asserted for a few cycles. Go back, write another test in your IP verification environment Tested it, uh, it, test it again, make sure that function is tested uh, exhaustively, come back and then you integrate the uh, IP again into your SOC environment. One can argue, you know, uh, it's too late to go back to IP. Then at least you know what are the functions which are not really tested well at IP level. So then you can focus your effort at SOC level to target those functions. One of the issues that a lot of people deal with is, is IP is not characterized as well as they think, or it's not characterized necessarily for the context of where it, you're going to put it, right? Yes. I mean, that's part of what you're talking about That is here. correct. That is correct. So now coming back to my example here, as I said earlier, this is the state space that my IP was, uh, uh, you know, capturing. So if I have to use my, this IP into my SOC environments, ideally my IC, uh, my SOC should explore behavior which is a subset of this or worst case this is you know within the boundary of what IP supports because if it is outside this I'm going to run into problems right because my IP was tested for this function my SOC has to use all those functions within those parameters if it is going to go outside you're going to run into problems because your IP either doesn't support it or was not verified for it so if you can if you run into those issues, automation is that you should be able to find those, these issues in a very, very predictable way and very, very quickly. You don't want to go through the through the debug cycles of a day, a few days to a week to figure those issues out. What this whole methodology provides is a very, very predictable and automated way to find those issues. What happens when you're dealing with internally developed IP, which really probably works and characterized for any of this stuff. They're just saying, companies are saying, okay, we've already developed this, we want to use it for the next chip that's coming out. It may not even work with that context. At IP level, you don't, and that's why this methodology is very, very critical, right? And uh, third party uh, IPs, obviously, as you said, you don't have that much control, so it becomes kind of a little bit, you want to be a little bit pessimistic and you want to get that behavior captured from your uh, uh, third party provider. But even for internal IPs, if you go to, you know, large uh, size SOC companies, they have very, you know, good demarcation between their IP teams and SOC teams. Uh, they do share some uh, verification workload uh, once in a while, but 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 they know IP team is going to support these IPs and they're going to go into multiple SOCs and SOC teams may be different across locations, across countries. Um, so 
irrespective of whether it is internal IP or external IP, challenges are same. The only benefit is if it is internal, uh, internal, you can resolve it much quicker because you have better communication. You're talking about properties and then you're talking about assertions. Are they the same thing or are they interchangeable? There is a very minor uh, difference here. So properties are basically describing the behavior of your design. Um, so if you expect that property to be true all the time, it becomes an assertion. But if this is something you have to verify before you taper your design, that becomes a coverage. So there is a very minor difference, but people do use them use these two terminologies interchangeably. And how many are we actually talking about when we look at it, all the IP that's being integrated here? So our experience has been that you get on an average one property per, per 20 RTL lines in your code. So it's not that uh, much. It actually gives you a very good uh, density for your RTL, which means it captures uh, your RTL behavior and your test bench behavior in a very comprehensive way. Um, can these assertions be automatically generated? Yes. Actually, it, as part of the system, this assertion sensors technology is meant to generate these all these properties automatically. The, actually, it is using your existing infrastructure. There's no manual effort required in this methodology. What you need is your RTL and your simulation environment, which you have anyway, and it, it is just using that information to generate those properties for you. So when do you actually generate all these assertions? What, what's the timing on, on a design? Yeah, so uh, what we see is when you are uh, starting your IP verification, uh, maybe let's say if your, your verification cycle at IP level is, let's say, six months. So when you are starting to build up your environment, that is not the right time to generate properties because you're still bringing up your uh, uh, verification environment. During your verification cycle, maybe you know three, four months down the line, uh, when you see that your verification environment is maturing, that is the right time to generate properties. In fact, you know there are there is automation uh, built into this methodology where uh, we can continue to monitor your progress. And you can use that information actually to drive your verification environment. You know, what are the new things that you have to add or new tests you have to add? Uh, you can do that as well as you can use the same information to figure out what exactly is the right time to generate, uh, generate the assertions for your SOC consumption. And also, some of these assertions are handwritten. Some of them are automated. And how do they mesh? Is it, there a problem there? Yeah, no, there is no uh, problem uh, because we are using uh, standard SVA. Uh, format as well, so they can play uh, with each other. You could argue there could be some uh, uh, overlap, that is possible, but what we have seen, typically people write interface properties where they're just trying to uh, capture the behavior of their input constraints as well as how their out uh, outputs are supposed to behave uh, uh, based on that stimulus. So there can be um, some duplication, but good thing is, if you are not writing manual uh, properties or, or are writing manual properties, you're not missing anything, because our experience is that uh, assertion th synthesis can generate all the properties that are relevant for our RTL as well as your simulation environment. Ravindra, Anija, thank you very much for a great explanation. You're most welcome, Matt.